a mayor of Reddy. Today we have Professor Balatunda Kolia with us. Professor Kolia received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Vanderbilt University. As an undergrad, he was also a starting fullback on the Vanderbilt football team. He then received his PhD from Purdue University back in 2008. He is currently a professor at Georgia Institute of Technology. Professor Kolia brings science to energy and thermal management solutions. His research focuses on characterization and design of thermal transport and energy conversion in nano devices. He has also been the recipient of multiple awards and honors and also founded Carbice Nanotechnologies. Let's hear more from him as he shares his stories. Our interviewer for today is Mauricio Seguera, a PhD student in the mechanical engineering department who is also a current vice president. Mauricio, over to you now. Thank you very much, Swati. Dr. Kola, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here with you all. No, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Um, as I was talking to the corner store of BNC, uh, Mary Jo, 2008 was it was a pivotal year for the alumni at uh, at Burke and Purdue. Um, 2008, we you've seen some of the rosters of the people we've interviewed. Um, I have one of my very own professors, Dr. David Go, who uh, nice. I interview. I went to the University of Notre Dame, so I was able to uh, kind of get to see how. People from Dr. Uh, Tim Fishen's group grew up and became phenomenal researchers and professors, such as yourself. Uh, but before we delve into 2008, let's take a step back to the early years of your life. Uh, where did you grow up? Um, can I say something first? Of course. So, uh, Mauricio, I was the founding vice president of the Nanotechnology Student Advisory Council. Nice. So you were in my seat. I, I'm honored to see you and to know that you, it's just amazing the connectivity that you worked with David. So uh, a little, little background story. Oh, I so. appreciate that. That's good to know. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, um, the honor is truly mine, believe me. No, no. Um, yeah, to your question. So um, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, and I was actually born in Detroit, spent the first four years of my life there, grew up in Pensacola, which is where my mother is from. Um, my father's from the Bronx in New York, mother's from Pensacola, so very interesting household mix. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's an interesting, it's a panhandle place, military place. My grandfather worked as an airplane mechanic on the Pensacola Naval Base. And uh, people love football in Pensacola, so the nice. home of it, Derek Brooks and a lot of other people. So Awesome. So what would you say were some of your childhood experiences that kind of put you towards the path that you're on right now? Or would you say that growing up, you were kind of being pushed towards a different career path? No one ever really pushed me towards a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm the youngest of three. And I think at that point, everybody was kind of tired enough where they just let me do my own thing. Um, so, I, you know, my mom uh, put me in school early when I just turned four so she could go back to work. Um, I was a reader. I used to like reading a lot and I never really thought about technical things for a while until probably I was in the first grade and I realized that my father spent a lot of time with me on math and things like that and encouraging that. So I think that that kind of always made technical things and engineering interesting to me. And I, you know, I, I started in Boy Scouts at four and I used to build a lot of things. Um, and I'm an Eagle Scout, so I, I was in it for a long time. So I've always liked that. So I think that I, I always knew that I would do something where I would use my hands. But um, to be honest, I, I kind of never settled on anything because I like a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think ultimately I decided to be an engineer because I was good at math and science. And I thought, well, let's stick with what you're good at. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, would you say that even through middle school and high school, science and math were definitely your stronger suits? It's what I what I identified as being good at. I you know I've I always enjoyed um, uh, reading and, and history and literature and things like that. But you know I I think that from a grade perspective, you would, math and science probably were my strongest suits. Um, so I, I kind of kept with that for a while. Did you also start up sports at a young age as well? I was reluctant into sports. To be honest, um, my older brother has always been the better athlete, and it was really I got into football because my parents said that he couldn't play unless I played. So I remember when I was in the second grade, him taking me out into the backyard and throwing footballs at my head until I figured out how to catch them. <laughs> <laughs> Typical older brothers. 
<laughs> yeah, typical older brother. And so I hated my first year of football, to be honest. And uh, I wanted to quit. My mother um, wouldn't let me quit. And um, it was a good decision. And, I, you know, she talked me into it. She wasn't like, you have to. She just was very good at um, manipulating my mind with how she spoke to me. And so I stuck with it. And then I had a good ending to that season. And then I kind of caught the bug after that. I kind of liked it I, just because I started to have some success and I was pretty good at it. And I stayed with it as a result of that. So would you say that you, say that you knew that you were going to continue gonna sports when sports you were going to college? Yeah, I mean, at some point, um, because I, you know, the next year I played football, I, I won all these awards. I was like the league all-star. I had a great season. So I, you know, I then became a part of my identity because people knew me as the guy who was really good, like the giant running back. I was like the biggest guy on the team, but I played running back. So I tell people I used to run down the field with like three boys on my back and carry him like 20 yards. Uh, so I, <laughs> I had like an early growth spurt. Um, so yeah, you know, I, that at that stage, I just thought, well, you know, I would go in and play football, you know, and I started to watch a lot, develop heroes that were players. Um, so, you know, I, 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 in high school, it became a plan of mine to focus on doing the best I could at sports and also being a good student so that I could have the options that I wanted, which was to be able to go to the schools I wanted to go to and also play sports at a, at a higher level. Nice. So it sounds like uh, you were already very grounded in the general gist of what you wanted to do. But once you got to undergrad, you know, you had a plethora of options to choose from. How did you choose what you wanted to major in? Well, I, I went there knowing that I was going to major in engineering already because I had in high school decided, um, you know, I thought about being a lawyer, um, I thought about philosophy. I, you know, these I like a true philosophy. Renaissance, man. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I really do like I, I actually. So the funny story, the reason I chose Vanderbilt, I only applied to three schools, huh. Georgia Tech, Michigan and Vanderbilt, because they were the Big Ten, the ACC, SEC football wise. And they ha also had great education. Mm -hmm. And I was actually headed to Georgia Tech. I, that, that had been my selection until financial aid came in because I was not on any athletic scholarship when I started. And Vanderbilt really, they just blew me away with how they they competed and became like the best financial situation for me. But I think if I dig deeply, I also liked Vanderbilt because it's a liberal arts school. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to pursue some things that were of interest to me. Like I first declared a minor in philosophy when I first started. Um, and I took a lot of philosophy classes um, until it started to affect my GPA too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, uh, they 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 tend to get you. The, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. So I and so then then I moved to econ and I started taking accounting and econ. I said I'm gonna do a minor in econ, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, it didn't help my GPA much better. Um, so I ended up graduating with a minor in mathematics. <laughs> so, right. so I went back to technical things that that worked well for my GPA. <laughs> But I tell you, like the best class I took as an undergrad was this class called psychological anthropology. And I and I hate that I took it past fail my last semester, my senior year, because at that point I was so scared of liberal arts at Vanderbilt uh, ruining my GPA. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up making an A and I did well. It was, it was a class where we studied this tribe in South America called the Mayanaku that's a dream culture. And we had to like keep dream journals and write about it. So anyway, I, I have a lot of interest outside of science and technology. But I, you know, I, I think I have a more of a skill set in doing technical things sometimes. Well, that, that's pretty cool. It, it yeah. sounds like uh, you, you're a true Renaissance man, a, a jack of all trades, and choosing a, a a major like mechanical engineering is is of course in and itself a, a difficult discipline to do. But you know, you're already in in college. Um, you're you're doing sports. Uh, you're doing well in academics. Uh, somewhere along the way, the idea of academia must have been placed in your mind, or did you go about and look for that on your own? How did the idea of becoming a professor or pursuing a PhD come into play during your undergrad life? So I, I met um, uh, Professor Tim Fisher my freshman year at Vanderbilt. He was my assigned academic advisor to like put you in classes. Um, he played a big role because you know he had played baseball in college, and he was kind of a interesting guy. Um, so 
you know, I, the idea of being a professor, he kind of made it, he was broke the mode, I guess, of the stereotype that I had of professors. So I, I you know, it became something somewhat interesting. But to be honest, I, I didn't really know a lot about school past the undergrad mm -hmm. level because I wasn't really paying attention until my junior year. I didn't even know that you got paid to be a grad student as an RA. Um, in my junior year, I was taking a system dynamics class and the professor, Kim Frampton, started talking about grad school and he mentioned that you can actually get a salary for doing research and it blew my mind. Um, that was like the first beginning step, uh, right? But it, I, it, you know, there's no way I was going to be a professor while I was living in Nashville. Like mm -hmm. that, that thought didn't come to my mind until I made it to Purdue. Um, because I, I still didn't really understand what professors did until I got into my PhD program. I see. I see. So uh, in, in that case, uh, you decided to pursue a master's. Um, did I did. You, in order to get the experience or why did you choose to pursue a master's? I chose to pursue a master's um, because of sports. Because of sports. Um, I tore my ACL my freshman year, uh, spring semester. Uh, which ruined my chance of getting a scholarship, even though I was doing well on the team. Um, I rehabbed, came back my junior year. I retoured my ACL. Um, and then my senior year, I decided that I would give football another chance. And I had already pretty much had a job lined up with uh, Schlumberger. And I was ready to graduate and just go work a job. Didn't even really apply to grad school, and I went out in the spring of my senior year for football, and I ended up getting a scholarship. There was a new coach, new opportunity. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, I went to grad school. For, so I would not have gone to grad school without that. And then when I went to grad school, I was actually doing the professional masters uh, the first year mm -hmm. project. End of my football season, I tore my ACL for a third time. Oh man! Yep. And um, Tim Fisher called me the next day and, you know, was like, hey, you're going to hang it up now, right? Um, you know, and then he gave me advice. He was always kind of a mentor. He said, hey, you should, since you're going to stay to finish your master's, you should switch to a thesis because just in case you decide to get a PhD, I didn't know he was like planting a seed to recruit me to Purdue. He said, like, just in case you decide to get a PhD, mm -hmm. getting a thesis would be good. And, that wasn't that big of a deal to me because I love doing projects and I already had a project that I come up with my own. So I just said, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So I switched to a thesis uh, degree uh, the next year and completed it. And in that process, learned about research and for the first time in my life, was able to focus on school and not sports and school and a thousand other things. Right. And I discovered how enjoyable it was to live that life for me. That's awesome. Um, so I, Dr. Tim Fisher was your uh, was your mentor, so I guess it wasn't too hard of a decision on who your PhD advisor should be. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, the question would be, you know, in this time, right, 2000, what the, you went into grad school, I'm assuming 2005, six, you started? It was 2005, yeah. 2005, and you know, that's that's right the turn of the millennium. New advances are coming up in, in uh, a bunch of technology, especially now in technology. So how did you go from, you know, Eagle Scout who who does stuff with his hands, you know, a football player who, who runs, you know, yards to working with these nanometric materials? How, how did that come about? Why did you choose to pursue a project uh, that had to do with nanotechnology. So, um, you know, my father in his career um, worked at chemical plants and did uh, emergency relief valve sizing for pressure vessels and other process tanks. Okay. Sounds kind of boring. That's what yeah. I thought it yeah, too. However, it's one of the most complex thermodynamic problems that you can solve. And a lot of the practical things that are done in industry have no complete solutions. So you mm -hmm. use these $80,000 a year software and a lot of empirical things. And I say all that to say that I struggled with thermodynamics when I first got hit with it, like a lot of people. And it was the first time in my life that I made a smart decision and decided to, instead of struggling on my own, to reach out to my dad for help. Mm -hmm. And he helped me through that. And in helping me through that, and me actually getting an A in thermo, it made me really want to learn more about heat transfer and thermodynamics. 
So I got to nano through heat transfer because Tim Fisher was a heat transfer person. So that it was through that experience, first struggling with thermal, then picking up a research project with Tim uh, as an undergrad. Tim introduced me to diamond nanoparticles that he was making to do cooling of oil mm -hmm. in transformers for electro, uh, you know, electrical power transmission. Or um, uh, so, so basically, I got exposed at Vanderbilt to nano materials, and then I didn't start on the nanotube right away because Tim wasn't able to grow them, but he was trying to, right. and he was telling me about it, and I was learning, and so it stayed in the back of my mind. And when I when I finished my um, Masters, I wasn't sold on going into a PhD. I took a year off uh, mm -hmm. to do some things in politics and real estate. Mm -hmm. And when I realized how hard it is to do a business where you're not differentiated or have a lot of money to support it, I said, you know what, maybe I should give this nanotechnology thing that I, I find fascinating and try. Right. And that's when I kind of called Tim and said, hey, I think I want to work on that carbon nanotube. I don't know what, but I, I, I want to work on it. And so I, I only applied to one grad school. Um, I, I went to Purdue, and I said, I'm just, if I'm gonna do a PhD, it's with Tim. But in that first six months, he let me do research and read as many CNT papers as I could. And I actually read a paper a day for six months wow. to figure out what I wanted to do with the carbon nanotube. And in the meantime, I kind of helped students with projects, shadow people. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Moshman, Shu Jun, uh, and some other people who were senior in the group to figure out what I wanted to do with it. Um, so that's kind of how it came to. I just knew the material was, it was very interesting, it was important. And then as I started to read those papers and I realized that I was learning a lot about it, I liked the fact that um, I could be somebody who was early in it and learned a lot of the cool things that um, could lead to different applications. Nice. So on top of being one of the first people to do that, you know, Burke started up in 2006. So I'm assuming there was this mass influx of students who wanted to do uh, nanotechnology. And of course, you were one of the first at Burke. Correct? Yeah, I was the first. Um, was Tim the first. recruited me to Purdue by sending me a flyer and a schematic of what Burke was going to look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, you can be the first one in this building and choose which all you know he's a salesman uh -huh. so he choose which office you know so yeah it's i was ready to go he convinced me that i could be the first in burke and that i could violate the second law of thermodynamics with nanotechnology <laughs> <laughs> he, he he came through on, on one of those things right, right. <laughs> not quite the second not quite the second so what was, what was, your, impression? Second. What was your first impression of burke when you walked in oh i loved it it was the most it was I loved being in Burke. And this is one of the reasons that uh, you know the Nanotechnology Student Advisory Council was something that we had to do and something I enjoyed so much because I I enjoy giving tours of Burke, and I got so much experience talking to people and interacting with, you know, Millie Dresselhouse. I gave her a tour. Um, uh, Dick Luger. I gave him a tour. Charles Vest. I gave him a tour. Tom Kenny of DARP. I mean, I gave so many people tours of that building, and. I always volunteer for because I just was so impressed at the volumetric air per second that was being replaced. You know, I had all the stats down for the nanotechnology room. <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome. awesome. Um, on, that on, note, on that note, you, you know, you, you like you like giving tours. tours. I was reading on, I was reading up on you a little bit, and and you do a lot of outreach, out out especially for uh, uh, younger the younger generation. You know, the importance of outreach cannot be overstated. Could you tell us a little more about how you perform outreach, outreach, or when did you start doing this? Did you start giving back to the community through outreach? I mean, I've, I've always done a lot of service. I mean, I was from Boy Scouts um, to, you know, my mother and grandfather were very involved in the community in Pensacola. Um, so I used to tag along with them to service things. So just whatever I'm doing, I have a habit of sharing it with people. So I like that, and I think it's important. Um, and I like the challenge of taking something that people think is complex and um, communicating that in a way that they can understand it. Because I think it's important to do that because I think people create a lot of false barriers for themselves and false narratives about what's hard, what's not hard, what's possible, what's not possible. And sometimes things just take some time, but I think most things should be accessible to everybody. Um, and that's kind of the philosophy I take towards outreach. I look for where people are not making things accessible because they think 
there's a barrier and I just go and attack that problem because um, I think it's a challenge that I like to distill things down and yeah. reach those. Yeah. You know, you made a good point. Um, it, it sounds like your outreach philosophy kind of intertwines with it, what essentially was culminating in your final project or the project that went on to uh, found your your company, Carbice Nanotechnology. You took a problem of, you know, uh, exchanging thermal energy between surfaces and you essentially uh, came up with a, a brilliant solution. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your research while you were at, at Burke what, what, so that the audience could get more acquainted? What did you do? You know, I came to West Lafayette from Nashville and I when you come from a city like that, it has a lot of liveliness. It's kind of a capital city to a small town. You know, for me, I came very focused on accomplishing very specific goals as fast as possible, to be frank. Um, not who, who, yeah, never knowing that I would have as much fun to meet the best people in the world there and meet my wife there and, you know, have all these great experiences. And I say that to say that I, I, I you know, worked on applying the carbon nanotubes as a thermal interface material between chips and heat sinks to solve problems that using thermal grease or thermal paste has in terms of reliability and performance. I specifically, because there was a senior student before me that had demonstrated this use case, I specifically developed metrology based on lasers that could take the interface and break it down into its constituent resistances. So break it to a finer scale of understanding to understand where in the interface was the real point of focus for engineering improvement. Mm -hmm. So I developed a technique um, in collaboration with Tim and Sean Fen Shu um, to this photoacoustic technique that allowed us, instead of getting one bulk value for how the thermal resistance of the interface was, to be able to decompose it into the resistance of the material and the resistance of the two true contacts. And so that became my thing, is to be able to, to use that. And then once you develop a technique like that, then you can do studies that were previously inaccessible mm -hmm. to study the effect of different parameters on those different parts of the resistance equation at different temperatures and different pressures. Um, so I ended up, because of that, having a pretty prolific uh, output in three and a half years. I published 14 papers. Mm -hmm. And I went to many conferences, you know, several per year presenting it because the timing of things was such that this topic was a hot topic, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, that was the research. It started off very, very fundamental. It started off literally with me rederiving the partial differential equations to solve a steady periodic heat transfer equation in one dimension and to solve the boundary conditions to add in contact resistance and test the sensitivity, develop a sensitivity. There's a Fortran code of, you know, several Fortran. hundred. Fortran 90 Fortran. or Fortran 77? Uh, it was Fortran 90. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we had Fortran code to do all this. To, and so very fundamental. And I love that, right? Here I am, the you know, I ended up getting actually a double major. It was a math major and a mechanical engineering because yeah. I took so many extra math courses because I liked it. It was good for my GPA. Um, <laughs> so 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 it, it combined everything and then because I you know I was funded I, I was got a um, Intel and a NASA fellowship to support my PhD um, and I was able to spend time in the summer at Intel the, you know so it was that combination then that I had all this fundamental stuff I was doing the later stage of my PhD research I started doing more applied things and studying different application uh, use cases um, and so it was a nice mix in my work afforded by the opportunity of the timing that uh, went from the pure fundamental all the way into the apply, which was a great foundation, frankly, for starting a faculty career. No, definitely. Um, that, that that's that's incredible. The uh, you know you you talk about how uh, you you did an internship at at Intel or you were sponsored by Intel. I was sponsored by Intel. Mm -hmm. uh, they paid, you know, fellowship, and then I also interned um, in the summer of 2007. I see. So during that time, you know, uh, you you now have two paths. Well, you have multiple paths, but two of the main paths that people tend to have is continue in industry, either 
a, a career in a company or maybe some R&D work or continue academia. Was there at any point you were leaning towards one or the other or did you have your sights set on academia professorship? Academia was three. It was third on the list. Third, okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go to Silicon Valley. I was working with this startup company called Nano Conduction. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, Tim had a collaboration with, and I kind of picked up uh, lead on it. And um, I, I had planned to go to Silicon Valley. That was actually my plan when I went to Purdue was that, and I told Tim, I was very frank. I said, I want to come to grad school, get a PhD and go be a part of Silicon Valley. So what's the project that I need to be on to mm -hmm. make that happen, right? And that all happened. I had that opportunity. Um, I kind of knew that that was the the kind of the all in approach. I was that, that was it. I, um, the Intel thing came in because of the fellowship and I had the opportunity for that. And the money was good too. Nobody pays better than Intel. I mean, I, when I drove out from West Lafayette to Chandler, Arizona, uh, my then girlfriend went with me and I, um, I, I actually got engaged at the um, the Continental Divide. Wow. Uh, you're right. And so, so you know, you know, that trip, so going to Intel and actually having the money, frankly, to buy an engagement ring because of that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and like start thinking about life. That actually influenced my decisions too, because ultimately there were two reasons why I got offered a job actually in nano production mm -hmm. in Sunnyvale. And I turned it down because one, I didn't think the technology was really ready yet. And two, um, I wasn't ready to live the struggling entrepreneurial life, um, having, you know, planning to get married soon. Mm -hmm. um, then industry kind of fell out because the more I dug into faculty and the freedom to do your work, to interact with young people and to even start a business, that became a more attractive option over time than industry. And so that's what I ended up doing. I ended up choosing that option because it was going to, um, I had 70,000 in student loans from Vanderbilt still. So I, you know, I, I got a scholarship when it was too late, when I didn't really need one in grad school. <laughs> so so I, Vanderbilt was like one of the most expensive schools. Like, you know, I say I have all that student loan and I had a pretty decent academic scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. So it was expensive school. So, so a lot of that frankly led me to Georgia Tech led me to a faculty position where I could, you know, make a decent salary. I could have a somewhat, I could have a stable life. You know, people don't tend to think it's tenure track like that. It's very stressful and it is, you know, you're working hard, but you know, it's not like a startup. And I can tell you that from experience where you as an organization worry about running out of money for everybody. Man, uh, so what was the transition like from your graduate school life, you know, that, that small intern, um, sponsorship you had to a professorship because you know as a grad student we're not exposed to all of the aspects of professorship you know writing grants and uh, teaching so what was that transition like for you it was difficult I, I had terrible teaching reviews the first semester I taught and it, oh. it hurt my heart because I thought that I was a good teacher <laughs> <laughs> but, but but you know you know what I realized though I, I and here's the most important lesson I learned in that first semester is to not take things so seriously when you teach. Yeah. Right. I think, I think the reason I got bad teaching reviews is because I was really trying to be a stickler for getting the material across, mm -hmm. holding people accountable. You know, and the reality is that you want to not cover material, but you want them to learn material. Right. And I think that's one of the lessons I learned on the job. Um, but it was a hard transition because I was getting a lot of mixed advice from senior faculty around me. And, you know, in many ways, I might have taken the wrong advice from the wrong people about mm -hmm. some things, but I didn't really know better. Um, so it was a difficult transition and I didn't have a lab space for two years, even though on my interview, they pointed to where my lab space was and they wrote it in my letter that I would have this room. Um, then they gave it to the president, Bud Peterson, who happened to be a mechanical engineer also mm. and decided he wanted to do research. And I couldn't argue with the chair because he said mm. he. You know, he couldn't he couldn't say no. And then I said, well, where's where am I going to go? And so I didn't have any place to go. Um, however, you know, lemons to lemonade that motivated me to apply to the Air Force um, summer faculty program two years in a row when I first got there. And I went up in the summers and I stayed in Dayton, Ohio, 
and I did research in the Air Force lab and um, you know did that until I had some space to do my own work at Georgia Tech. Nice. Uh, what would you say that you like or dislike most about the assistant, the assistant professor position when you first came in? Obviously, uh, not having a lab space for two years kind of kind of might be on the bottom of the list, but what would you say that you liked the most about becoming a professor during that time? I mean, I like working with the people because even though I didn't have a lab space, um, you know, I had a lot of money because I had, uh, you know, two big DARPA grants when I first started and they were collaborative. So I could get some students working in my collaborators labs and um, doing things there. And um, so just being able to collaborate broadly with people was nice. Um, in the, you know, Georgia Tech's such a big place. You know, there are great people in pockets that I found that were so supportive. Um, I, I think the um, the process of getting better as a professor, as a teacher, was was enjoyable for me um, to kind of test my mental hypothesis about how, what I thought I was as a teacher and to see that evolve. You know, I, I, I like getting better at things and I like identifying misconceptions that I have about anything, including myself. So I enjoyed that um, part of being assistant professor. What, what I don't like or didn't like um, still is true today mm -hmm. and it's part of this, the profession. Um, I, I don't, I'm not really someone, frankly, that likes uh, doing a lot of self-promotion. However, you have to do that as a, a faculty member. Like you have to, um, you know, update your CV and try to find every little thing that you've done to put on the CV to make it look like you've been really productive. Um, and and I and that that's a that's a challenge for me to be frank. Every year when we have to do annual reviews and we have to like communicate these things, um, those things are challenging because um, I in general liked being collaborative and believe that teams do the best work but i ran into some issues with people asking questions about what's my unique contribution when i'm working on a bunch of teams mm -hmm. <laughs> so 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 it, and it's it's really it was so so counter to somebody like me who's used to organizational teamwork from sports and you know community work to be in an environment where I could actually be penalized for working as a team sometimes. Um, I think the culture's trying to identify that and change a little bit in academia, but that, that was a challenge for me, um, especially early on. Well, on top of the, uh, you know, the tremendous workload that an assistant professor has during the first part of uh, their years, you also went on to found a company, Carbice Nanotubes, uh, Nanotechnology, sorry. Uh, how did that come about? Uh, obviously it came through your research, but what what prompted you to establish a company for the material that you were working on? Yeah, so so the company um, today is Carbice Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because the nano thing it was kind of like in an early phase. Um, just so it's Carbice Corporation, but I, I started Carbice um, because I never gave up on the idea that this could be a profitable business. Um, I just felt technology was early. Um, I'm not a visionary that just said, now's the time to start a company. And I think this is a lesson for everybody about authentic demand and how to really see an opportunity. People start calling me mm -hmm. and asking me as a professor to make material for them and sell it to them. And I didn't want to do that because you don't get tenured that way. Right. <laughs> so, so, so I decided to go talk to George Tech and say, hey, people want me to do this. Um, how about I go start my own company and on the weekends I pay George Tech to make material and I'll sell it. And I did that. And once I did that a few times, then that's how Carbice was born. It was like, hey, I think it's time to set aside, you know, some weekends to do this. And so so that's how it started. And it started with the intention that it was really just an LLC and it was going to be kind of a consulting thing. But as I got into it, and as I advanced in my own research, which was exploring the thermal management problem with DARPA, um, people kept asking, because we were doing very well in that DARPA program, 
um, again, I was collaborating with Tim at Purdue. It was Purdue, Georgia Tech, and Raytheon. And we were one of four teams out of 16 that made it to the phase three of the DARPA program. And so that's really when I decided that Carbide should, should start kicking it into high gear. Um, the, the little caveat is that in the process of doing that, you know, because I just don't want to do things and um, be transactional, I'm a scientist. In the process of working on the weekends to make these materials to sell, I solved a problem mm -hmm. related to growing carbon nanotubes that was a huge problem for everybody. It was how to make them stick to a substrate, have uniform coverage, and grow at a fast rate. So that became the foundation of what Carbice is today. It's foundational IP. So much so that, you know, the company, as I started bringing people in, was better at making nanotubes than I could even make in my research lab. <laughs> you know, so at some point I started you know, getting material from the company just to do my research. Mm -hmm. And once that started to happen, I knew that this thing was serious and that I should really spend more time on it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Uh, what would you say, you know, now that you've you've become a professor, uh, I believe that you have been promoted to full professorship in 2019, correct? Yeah, yes, yeah. so I'm, I'm a full professor now as of 2019. Yeah, you, you're a founder of a company, you know, you're a full renaissance man. Oh, now you get to be on the other side of the aisle and see new talent, new generation come into the uh, atmosphere of academia. Uh, what would you say is different now than it was back then when you became a professor? How hard or how different is it to pursue this path? Because um, from my understanding, around 2008 during the recession, there was a point where there was a slight freeze of hiring straight from PhD to professorships. So then people went on to do some postdocs. And then yeah. fast forward three years, you have these people that are coming out of PhD, hoping to fill faculty positions, but you also have these uh, postdocs with three years of additional experience that kind of beefed up their resumes. So for sure, postdoc is definitely something that needs to look forward to. That's one difference. But what would you say is is another difference between becoming a professor now versus how it was when you first became a professor? Um, yeah, I, I was the I was the last hire at Georgia Tech uh, before they furloughed or stopped hiring. I tell people that in the first four years of Georgia Tech, um, I never made full salary because I was furloughed every year, and um, overhead on my grants went up like 20% every year. <laughs> so so that, that's a, a bit of a financial challenge, actually. It, you know, I actually, you know, um, got in the hole because of that with my students. Um, I, I don't, you know, no matter what, there are fundamental similarities in any time. Um, the first thing is that to get on at any place as a professor, you cannot rely on any process that's been set up by the institution to bring you in and give you an opportunity. You have to network and you have to have a strategy for why that place is a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. um, that never changes. And you have to be able to build a narrative around you that's con you're confident with that speaks to that. Um, so that that's that's a similarity that, that's the same i think that the funding climate is different now um there are more people competing uh the funding agencies have changed a lot of their rules and how they do things mm -hmm. um and to be honest i've lost a little bit of touch with some of it because it has moved so fast and you know as i become a late stage professor or mid-year mid-career whatever you want to call me i become more focused in where i go for money and i go to places that are um, easier for me to get money because I have like a history or legacy. So I like a lot of stuff in National Science Foundation. I, yeah, I'm not tracking as well, but I think the things that I did as an early professor, like going to review panels multiple times a year for the first five years and learning what this current state of thinking was in the community around funding and things like that. I think those are the same. Um, so I think those things will always be the same that, you know, in a society, in, in any organization which is uh, run by people, 
you have to know the people and you have to know the story you'll tell to get yourself into the place with those people that you want to be. But I, but I do think that the, you know, the past several years, the funding situation has been quite difficult. Um, um, that may change. I mean, I think now, you know, you get new leadership and government, things like that. Um, funding outlook could be better. Um, mm -hmm. It always depends on what you choose to work on. Right. So for those going into academia, you have to be a shape shifter to a degree to survive in academia. And you have to be able to take your expertise and interests and bend them to different thematic overtones mm -hmm. so that you can stay aligned with where where the collective resources want to move. I see. So in, in terms of that, what, what is your current research focusing on right now? So I'm, I'm on a leave of absence from Georgia Tech right now. Oh, I see. Um, spending most of my time at Carbice. Uh, I have an administrative role as the faculty athletic representative at Georgia Tech, um, a role that most people don't know exists, but it mm -hmm. exists at every school that has an athletic department. Mm -hmm. So I'm like the, um, uh, the, I guess, the compliance and academic oversight and the connection between the NCAA and the ACC. Um, and because of that, I've minimized my research footprint. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually in the process of resetting, right? The shape shifting thing that I mentioned right. to you, right? Uh, I'm not going, I'm not the type of person that will continue on something where the problem has been solved. And in many ways, with thermal interfacing and that part of what I used to do, that problem has been solved mm -hmm. in past the carbice. So I'm resetting research into some bio applications, actually. Nice. Uh, yeah, where we're going to see how, or we are seeing how these aligned carbon nanotubes can be antiviral, or they can be involved in um, um, uh, protein synthesis, or you know, cell manufacturing. So those those are some of the things that I'm interested in right now. That, that's awesome. That's impressive. Uh, what would you? Uh, I have a lot to. I have, to, I have a lot to learn in that. So I, I I'm leaning on collaborators, and um, you know. You know, maybe this summer I'll pick up a few books and try to read some more on on sales and bio. <laughs> sales and bio, no, definitely. Yeah, biology is a it's it's a vast field where, personally, I think there's a lot to memorize first. You know, when it comes to physics, chemistry, mathematics, there there are fundamental axioms, concepts, but when it comes to biology, there's just there's just so much to to just memorize. You know, the structures of cells, processes for, uh, uh, you know metabolics it's it's absolutely crazy so what do you do for fun you know um, uh, apart from from the academic life uh you you have a family so what, what do you guys do to uh to kind of take the, the stress away or maybe it's not stressful at all no it's stressful <laughs> um i work out a lot um i enjoy lifting weights um during the pandemic i built a gym in my garage nice um, so I, I'm, uh, I, I've, you know, I've had a lot of knee injuries, as I mentioned earlier, for football, but some of them continued. So I had a surgery about a year and a half ago and been rehabbing that. Um, my um, children, my two daughters, they are involved in uh, gymnastics and softball. Um, I'm actually coaching my youngest daughter's softball team um, right cool. now. So, so that's kind of fun. Uh, it's a lot of fun, actually. It, it, that's de-stressing, um, getting out there with a bunch of six to eight year old girls uh <laughs> soft is really nice <laughs> and uh you know we like to just um you know um you know my wife is in real estate now you know even though she has a phd in physical chemistry um, wow. I, I, she's like your your neighborhood uh, uh phd chemist real estate agent nice. um so, so 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 we go around and look at neighborhoods and houses and mm -hmm. play in parks in different parts of atlanta that's kind of fun for us too Cool. Uh, what do you what do you see as when do you think you'll be getting back into uh, full professorship mode um, once your leave of absence is, is over? You know, in a lot of ways, um, I don't even know what that is. Right. Um, I think that you know you get to decide what what things are. Mm -hmm. I don't think people say that enough out loud, but um, if you try to categorize what it is to be a professor at any stage um, you can find a variety in that so i i'm i see myself now as i'm in full professor mode and 
uh, maybe what I'm doing might become the norm. Hmm. That's a very good point. Um, we have we have a, a question from the audience asking, is there any specific pattern or habit of yours that you think is beneficial to developing these brilliant ideas that you have? I do. Um, so I think my my habit that's counter um, the popular narrative is to share my ideas early when I have them. I never I never thought the uh, protecting against scooping thing was a valuable approach to thinking about science. Um, because if I did that, I think I would have spent a lot of time on terrible ideas. Um, so I've always been the one that when I think I have a breakthrough idea, the more breakthrough I think the idea is, the more sharing of it I do openly with everybody and get their feedback. And I use that as a collective process to filter it to something worth spending five to ten years on uh, rather than a year or two and then realizing that I spent it on the wrong thing. So so that's one thing that's in my process. Um, the other thing would be um, do I remember the nano wrap? Of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's some CNTs on it on it on it. Uh, <laughs> no. Hot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize there was a nano wrap. You you got to tell us more about that. <laughs> So just following this train of thought, how do I know if it's groundbreaking or terrible? I start off thinking it's groundbreaking always, and I let other people tell me it's terrible, and I dig into why they are telling me it's terrible. Like some of the things I've worked on that have been groundbreaking, people have told me it was terrible, but the reasoning that they had wasn't good enough reasoning. So I think that that's where you have to have some confidence in a process to hear negative things and then objectively put them through a filter to decide if you know and you got to be very honest with yourself right. when you process negative things and see if you're being biased i think that that's the where i really um maybe have a a, a skill set is in, in being self-reflective and aware and so that, that's how I, I filter between those two things um i i also never work on something without knowing what it is and its potential to have an application, a real application. Like I'm not one of those professors that that works on some fundamental science, knowing that it will never be scaled up to something in my mind. Like I can't think of it, but I just say someone will do that. I don't do that. Like if I work on something, I always think about where the end game is. And if the end game is in something that's applicable and has a big market, I approach it from the day one like that and how I think about the problem, how I solve it. If the end game is undetermined by me, like if I can't get to where it's going to go, I call it exactly what it is. It's exploratory. Mm -hmm. And I, do, I, I say it is for my interests only. I'm not really working towards a game changing application, right? And I'm very honest with myself and my approach about that. And I always kept a mix in my portfolio of one thing or two that was like that, where I worked on it out of pure scientific interest. Mm -hmm. And I never feigned or faked that it was going to solve climate change. <laughs> and then I, everything else would be things that I had worked through a logical process to convince myself and check it with other people that working on this and getting it right, it had the economics, it had the social reasoning and all the other factors to be something that could be game changing. So I think there's a lot of being very self-reflective and honest with yourself mm -hmm. to be able to filter through, you know, what will end up being a bad idea versus a, a breakthrough. Nice. This filter, is, what, what would you say to the audience right now? How do you get a, a more wide area filter, you know, not just think about it in terms of the engineering and the physics, but start thinking about the social consequences of what you're working on. You know, uh, how could this benefit not just a very specific community, but all of humanity itself? Because that's essentially what the uh, what Carbice did. Right? You, you develop a, a solution to interface, thermal interface that has far reaching um, 
implications towards medicine, towards space, towards manufacturing. So how do you, what advice would you give to people who want to expand that type of filter to not just think about a very specific uh, field, but think about a more general uh, consequences of the work? It starts with how you view yourself. Um, you know, if I'm at a party and someone asks me, what do I do? A lot of times I say I do a lot of things. I don't say I'm a professor. Um, and I think that that's a mindset that I, I, I was actually sharing this with my 16 year old nephew recently that when I was doing my master's, I read uh, Benjamin Franklin's biography by Walter Isaacson. And the thing that really struck me was how Benjamin Franklin was nothing. Like he was, he, he just no, he, he wasn't a printed printer. He wasn't a scientist. He was, he was everything. He did it. He did. He was Benjamin Franklin because he did so many different things. And so I think when you think like that and say, hey, why are we all limiting ourselves to our job titles? Mm -hmm. Then it fosters curiosity in a lot of things. And I think that's what you have to be able to do is the more you're just naturally curious and willing to follow curiosity um, in a measured way, right? The more you can feed into a bigger picture of how things fit together. I think that's just that's that's where it comes. So I, I mean, as grad student, giving tours of the Burke Nanotechnology Center and talking to different people that came through, a lot of people who saw giving tours as a something that took away from their research time. I saw it as an opportunity to meet interesting people and learn their perspective. And a lot of times, I brought things into my research from that that gave it a competitive advantage. To be frank, um, so so I, I think that that's you know how I. It's just, you know, it's really, it's a really a, how it's a self perception, right? Mm -hmm. I think because this is what the world tells you, you, you go to school to get a job, you getting a, a profession, but that's really not your life. And be willing to have a life with no seams where things flow together and it brings a lot more opportunity. Um, someone, someone asked a question about how did I read a paper a day? This is an important question because yeah. I'd be remiss to not emphasize that when I came to Purdue, I had a fellowship. I, I never was funded as an RA. Um, and that's so important in how it enables you to do things. Um, and I know that's not available to everybody, but it's something that if you, I was very aggressive about applying for fellowships because at Vanderbilt, I was an RA and I was the TA. <laughs> and I saw how, how that, you know, took my time and things. And so when I came to Purdue, I had the spring and the summer to study for qualifying exams. Mm -hmm. So I did a little bit of research, did a little bit of that, this studying, and then I set aside my evenings um, in my single bedroom apartment, actually a studio apartment where I didn't have a television and I just read, I read a paper. Um, nice. You know, I, I made that a part of my routine to do that. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Don't, don't think that we're not going to ask you to to recite your nano rep. Because <laughs> you guys have a brief history on oh, oh, how did the nano rep even, uh, even come about? <laughs> Electronics getting hot, Moore's Law going to pop, something like that. I don't, I don't know. Throw some CNTs on it. It's all about Moore's Law and electronics getting hot and throwing some CNTs on it. <laughs> <laughs> There, there are just certain things in life that you uh, that you just remember. That's that's, that's right. <laughs> Here we go, Mary Jo. <laughs> I gotta tell you, Mary Jo has been um, has been gracing us with her presence with a lot of the alumni that we have from the uh, late 2000s to 2010s. So uh, she's she's definitely the cornerstone of BNC, and and we're very lucky for her to to bring back a few of the memories that you may not recall or may not want to recall. So no, I recall. I mean, you know, Mary Mary Jo was like our our group mom. So I mean, she she's I, I'm not surprised she brought that wrap up now. That I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to perform that in front of all of Burke before I left. You did. So <laughs> nice. I did. Yeah, yeah. I was I was uh, strong armed into doing that. And uh, uh, Steve Hodson and Bobby Sayer were were uh, my co-conspirators on that. Uh. <laughs> awesome. 
That's very awesome. Uh, is there is there anything that that you would want to tell us? You know, the the quote unquote newer generation of grad students. Any advice, whether it's just grad school or um, just life in general? Work with less fear and more optimism. Work with less fear and more dimension. optimism. I like that. Yeah, every dimension. Um, things that people tell you to be afraid of, just sometimes reevaluate that, like mm -hmm. the scooping that stuff because there's more that will come to you the more that you share with others and interact with others well, those are those are very powerful words thank you i'm gonna write that one down on my sticky notes and put that up <laughs> on the desk well uh it seems like we've exhausted the questions from the audience do you have any questions for us keep i'm so happy to see the Nanotechnology Student Advisory Council doing so well and um, with your leadership um, and, and others, I'm sure. I mean, because we are still at the beginning of what nanotechnology is going to do for society and, and people. Um, and I, I fully believe in that. So I, I am the biggest fan of all things nano, not because I'm a science geek, but because I, I feel the impact coming. And I'm seeing it from a different perspective now that I'm at Carbice. No, uh, we also thank you very much for uh, setting the the groundwork for for NSAC to to thrive essentially these these past thirteen years, uh, thirteen fourteen years. No, we we yeah. really appreciate you, and I, I am honored to hear that you were the founding vice president. So I have big shoes to to fill. <laughs> so only the only shoes you have to fill um, is, are your own. And you An fill another thing on the sticky notes, I got to put that one down. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Cola, and um, just uh, keep in mind, we'll be sending you an email soon for uh, an appreciation coffee mug for, for coffee hour, so be on the lookout for that. You'll be getting one, so right. just uh, be on the lookout. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cola, for your time. Um, say hi to the family for us. Uh, Mary Jo, thank you very much for, uh, for coming you, by and, and, and introducing you. us to, to the nano wrap. And, Good uh, to see you so much. Thank, thanks for bringing up the wrap, too. That was so much fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See you all later.